My name is Yusuf Estes, and originally I'm from Texas. I live now in the Washington, D.C. area. And I came to Islam about 20 years ago because of something very special. Before I came to Islam, I used to call people to Christianity. Everywhere I went, I would be carrying my Bible with me. I would have my salib or cross. And I even had a cap, a hat, that said, Jesus, you know, Isa, Jesus is Lord. Do you know, I didn't realize then how funny I must have looked. I didn't realize it. But in those days, I was very passionate about communicating the message that I felt people needed to know. A message about love, a message about peace, and a message about being a good person so that when the last day comes, the Yom al -Akhar, that we'd be prepared for that. The daily life that I had before coming to Islam was filled with two things. Working hard to make business, make money, tijara, and working hard to tell people about Jesus and the message of peace. It surprised me to find out that in Islam I could work more and communicate more, that's for sure. Before I met the person that helped me to know more about Islam, I used to have a very bad picture about Islam and Muslims. In fact, I was so afraid to even meet a Muslim that when my father told me we'd be doing business with a Muslim, I said, no, no way. No, these guys, Muslims, they are terrorists, they are hijackers, they are kidnappers, and they don't believe in God. In fact, they're worshiping a black box in the desert, and they kiss the ground five times a day. That was the way I understood Islam, a very bad opinion, and a bad idea of how they treated women, and how they treated children. I thought that Really, it was almost like they want to put everybody in prison. This was the idea that I had. But then I had never really met a Muslim until we started doing business with a man from Egypt. When I first met this Egyptian gentleman, I was surprised because I was expecting to see some man wearing a long dress and a black robe over it and a big turban or imama on his head, and he has one eyebrow, goes all the way across like this, maybe carrying a sword, you know, a safe, Hossam, like this, and maybe, you know, something like Ayatollah Khomeini, I don't know. But then, when I met this man, I was so surprised. He was wearing normal clothes, and he looked as normal as anybody. He didn't even have a big beard. In fact, he didn't have any hair because he was even bald-headed. <laughs> he was nice, a really nice person. And I thought right away, hey, I bet I can convert him to become a Christian. That was my idea. I'll make him become a Christian. But Allah had other plans. One of the things that really amazed me, you say in Arabic, ajib, ajiban, amazing, astonishing, was the way this man, although very quiet, gentle, kind, but what's amazing was the way that he, every day, he would do the salawat al khams. Every, every day, he would pray five times a day, on time. He would say, excuse me, I'll be right back. He would go and make wudu. Then, Allah Akbar. Do his salah, some dhikr, dua, and come back to us and start working again. Every day, except one day a week. Yawmul Juma, he stops everything. He said, I will be back in two hours. He would get ready and drive to the masjid 
do his salah there and come back. And it took almost a half hour, almost a half hour just to get there. So that's why he had to take two hours off. But he would still come back and go right back to work again. So the man would work seven days a week, but he would stop for his worship. Another thing that he did, he liked to fast some on Mondays and also on Thursdays. And you would go to him and say, would you like this? You want some of this, so-and-so? He'd say, no, no, it's okay, I'm fasting. One amazing thing about him that even my father talked about was how honest he was in business. Anytime there was any business transaction whatsoever, he always made sure the customer got full value for whatever it was they were doing and to be sure that they got the product that they were promised and then the follow-up to be sure that they were happy. That was another thing that we really were amazed about. You know, I thought, if we make this man a Christian, we could make him a saint, maybe even an angel, because he's so sweet, so nice. But do you know what happened? One day, while I was trying to convert him, he asked us about the Bible. And so I said, yes, I have a Catholic priest who will come to my house. I was a Protestant, this is two different religions, and my father would be there with his Bible. So I have my Bible. My father has a different Bible. The Catholic has another Bible. And we'll sit there and try to talk to him about all this. But then we began saying, which Bible, which Bible? You know, between us. All the time, the Muslim, he's sitting there, quiet. So we ask him, well, how many versions, you know, of that Quran do you have? Still one. Just one. And it's still in Arabic. The way it came, it's perfect. Nothing's missing. No words are missing. No pages are missing. Not even a dot is missing. Hmm. So then we had another idea. Let's talk to him about God. But when we start to talk about God, he said, can you explain Trinity? Well, we try to explain how three could be one. We get many examples, but none of them really hold up very good. Do you know that when we ask him, what do you guys say about God? He said, well, it's pretty simple. And he said what Allah said in the Quran, A'udhu Billahi min shaitani rajim Bismillahi rahman rahim Qul hu Allahu ahad Allahu samad lam yulid wa lam yulad wa lam yakuluhu kufwan ahad and do you know his argument was so strong we just sat there like this no expression imagine what a beautiful meaning this has when somebody knows when they really know Allah he is ahad unique one no partners and he takes care of everything and he has no father, he has no sons, he has no relatives, no daughters, no cousins, no uncles. And he is not like anything. He is a had unique. Amazing. Many people ask me, how did you feel about being a Christian? What was it like to be a Christian? Did you ever have any doubts about Christianity? Well, actually, at one point in my life, I was so involved in Christianity, believing in it, that I thought it was everything until I began to find mistakes in the Bible, serious mistakes in the Bible. And then it made me begin to doubt, not doubt about God, no, but to doubt about the Bible. And what about Christianity? Some of the things that we think about when we talk about this subject is, why is it called Christianity? Because if it's called Christianity, it means you have to follow Jesus, Christ. But what about all the people before that? They couldn't have known about him because he wasn't here. What about Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Suleiman, all the prophets? And then 
What about Jesus himself? Did he say, I'm a Christian? Actually, I found in the Bible, it says that they were never called Christians until they took their message to Antioch, long, long after Jesus was gone, long after Paul came into the religion and started changing things. Even then, he said, we were never called Christians until after Antioch. Then I started thinking, if the name is not right, the book has some mistakes, I don't know. But when I looked at other options, other religions, I wasn't very impressed. I really wasn't. And I had not really heard anything about Islam. And I never met any Muslims. Not until my Egyptian friend. But then I began to observe some things that really made me see a beautiful connection. One of the things that my Egyptian friend told me is that we Muslims believe in Jesus. I said, what? Because I know Jewish, you know the Yahudi, they believe in Adam and Abraham and Isaac, Ishak, Ismail, Ishmael. They believe in Suleiman and David and all these prophets. They believe in the Old Testament, but they do not believe in Jesus. Not as a prophet, not as a son of a God, not as a miracle worker, nothing. So how could a Muslim believe in Jesus? And he said, yes, we call him Isa. I said, okay, that's all right. It's similar to Jewish, Yeshua, Isa, Yeshua, okay. He said, and do you know what? We know he's a miracle birth. Oh, the Immaculate Conception, Mu'ajizah from Allah. So, okay, and we know that he did miracles. Even when he was born, he could speak. Isa alayhi salam, he could speak when he was born. And he told the people he was a prophet. And he had a mission. I was like, really? I don't know that. And he did miracles. People that had skin disease, they were cured. People who couldn't walk, lame, they were cured. People that were blind, and they were cured. Even a dead man was brought back to life. The story is in the Bible, Lazarus, but you're telling me a Muslim believes this? Huh? I said, yeah. I said, okay, well, what do you believe about Jesus? We say he's the son of God. What do you say? He said, we say he's the son of Mary. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. He is the son of Mary. He said, this way we don't have to try to resolve the issue of Son of God. Ibn Allah, a'udhu billah, astaghfirullah. Allah has a son, a'udhu billah. So this is where it really starts making you think. Muslims do believe so much, almost, you know, it's almost exactly, almost, but maybe a little bit different. Because when we came to the subject of Son of God, he said, no. Son of Mary, yes. Mu'ajizah, yes. Even the kalimat Allah, the word of God, the locals. When Allah wants anything, he just says, kun fayakun. Be, and it is. And that's how he created Jesus. And I thought, oh, it's in the Bible. The Kitab al Maqdis, that's what it says. Be, and it is. And that's how he made him. So, Maryam is the mother. God is the creator. Exactly what my Muslim friend told me. I thought, oh, if this is the case, what else do you believe? He said, we believe he's not dead. He's with Allah, and he will come in the last day. Oh, my God. I said, this man is going to be easy. I can convert him right now. This is almost the same thing. But then it happened. The big event happened. The Catholic priest friend of mine said, I want to go to the mosque. I want to see what do they do. And he went to the mosque. 
When he came back, we said, come here. What are they doing there? Do they like, you know, slaughter animals? You know, Zibiha? Or do they make uh, bombs, something? He said, no. He said, they line up, stuff. Then they stand like this. He said, like a monk or priest when they worship in silence. He said they were silent, stood like this. He said, really? He said, then they bow, rukua. Then, sajda. Then, sitting, silent. Not talking to each other, nothing. Silent. The whole time. Until, salam alaikum Salam alaikum I said, then? He said, they left. I said, what kind of music did they have? He said, they don't have any music. What? How do you worship God with no music? I was a music minister. I'm wondering, how? No music? He said, no. No music. I got to know more about this. Well, I did. I learned a lot more about it. Do you know what happened next? It came my turn. I became very curious. So I began asking some hard questions to the Muslim. What do you say about this? What about so and so? I heard Muslims, you know, they do so and such. And every time I ask him a question, he smiled. And he would tell me so many nice things. And I would think, huh, this is not the image I had in my mind. In fact, when I think about Isa, alayhi salam, what was his character like? How did he act? How did he treat people? How? And I said to myself, this man, this Muslim, is acting more like Jesus than the Christians. He never drinks alcohol. He never smokes cigarettes. He never lies. He never cheats. He doesn't chase the women, if you know what I mean. No. In fact, when ladies come close, he puts his eyes down. I said, if Jesus was here, this is what he would do. He would be like this man. I still wondered, how can I get him to be a Christian? It was still in my mind. How can I get him to be a Christian? But all along I was wishing I could be more like this man. Because he was at peace inside. No matter what happened. If we have a flat tire on the road, he's at peace with it. It's alhamdulillah, qadr Allah. I don't know what he meant. He said qadr Allah, mashallah. I don't know what it meant. But he would say that and he would smile. If we ran out of gasoline, no fuel. Alhamdulillah, qadr Allah. If I didn't have the money to pay for something, Qadr Allah, mashallah. No matter what happened, he was okay. I'm wondering how. How can this man be in such peace all the time? I wish I would be like that. You know, when I think about my friend, the Muslim, I almost laugh now to remember how patient he was with me. Because I would be telling him, you know, this and so and so, and come on and be a Christian. And he would smile. Finally, one day, he said to me, you know, I will go to your religion. If your religion is better than my religion. But you need proof. Proof? Well, we know in Islam that dalil is something very important. If somebody tells you anything, ana dalil yaqi. Right? But never in Christianity anybody said this to me. What is your proof? Proof? I even said to him, proof? Religion is not about proof. It's about faith. All about faith. No proof. He said in Islam, we have both. We have faith. But we have proof. And when he said that, 
it came in my mind. And I said to him, do you mean to sit there and tell me as a Muslim you can prove there's God? Then he said to me, do you mean to sit there as a preacher for Christians and you can't? Uh... Uh, now what could I say? Because I want to know what's his proof. Because I never thought about proof for anything. Just you hear somebody say it, you believe it. And they said, in the Bible, it says so and so. You look and read and read. You never find it. Where does it say it? He said it, okay, I believe it. No, in Islam, every single word you must be able to prove or you don't say it. Allah said, Kala Allah wa Kala Rasul. This is the haqqa of Islam. Kala Allah, the Quran. Wa Kala Rasul, the Hadith. Sahih Hadith. Bukhari, Muslim. And when he would explain, my Muslim friend, he would explain Islam to me, he would tell me, in Quran, Allah said, and he would say the Arabiya. I don't know Arabic. Zero. No Arabic. In those days, I didn't know one word. Not even Salaam Alaikum. Nothing. But he would still recite the Quran in Arabic. And then he would say, more or less, the English could be like this. And he would tell me. And he would say, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Huakala, he said, for instance, Khairukum manta alama al-Quran wa allama. And this in English, he would say, would mean, the best of you are those who learn, learn the Quran. And then you teach the Quran. So he would give me the Arabic. He would give me the English. Sometimes, listen to this, sometimes he would recite the Quran quickly. Quickly. Like, for instance, he might say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, kul hu Allahu ahad Allahu samat. I'd say, no, 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 stop. He said, why? He said, go slow. He said, why? I said, I like to listen to it. He said, but you don't know it. I said, but I like it. And sometimes when he would recite, I would feel like I want to cry. I don't know why. Like when he was recite, "A'udhu billahi min shaitani rajim Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum, la taqudhu sinatun wala naum, lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard." Man daladi yashfu indhu illa bi idni. يَلَامُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِهِمْ وَمَا خَفْهُمْ وَاللَّهِ يُهِتُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ إِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمِشْرَعَ وَاسِئَ قُرْسِيُهُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَا يَأْرُهُ حِفْتَهُمَا وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ When he got to this part, when he said, I think this why I told him, no, no, oh, slow, slow, what is this, what is this? And he explained about the curse of Allah, the arsh of Allah, so much details. And I'm thinking, oh, this man knows more about his religion as a geologist 
than I do as a preacher. How come the preachers of Christianity don't know about Christianity as much as some Muslims? Some Muslims know more about Christianity than some of the Christian preachers. And especially, how come nobody knows about Islam in the West? Nobody. Yet it's the most beautiful, logical way to explain the haq, the proof, la ilaha illallah. When you look to the mountains, you look to the oceans, you look to the stars, the moon, the sun, and you realize this cannot come by an accident. This has to be from somewhere. Where did you come from? Where did you get your brains? Who takes care of you every day? Who wakes you up? Who lets you go to sleep? Who gave you life? Who replaces the skin when you get hurt? Who is doing this? Anybody could say God does it. But not anybody has the proof of the Quran and the Sunnah, which clearly shows these proofs again and again. Every ayah of Quran showing these proofs. So look at the combination. We have a man living the example with the akhlaq. He has the behavior, the characteristic of Islam, and he has the basic knowledge. The simple knowledge of what? What are the Five pillars of Islam. Shahada, Salah, Salm Ramadan, Zakat al and Hajj fil Bayt Allah. Explain that. That's all he did. He just explained the basics. And what do we believe? Amana Billah. We believe in Allah. Wa malayakatihi and the angels. Wa kutubihi and the books. All the books all the way back. From the beginning until now, of all of the prophets, Lord Rasulullah, all of the prophets, and we make no separation between any of those, and we believe in the day of resurrection, Yamul Kiyama, the day of standing, literally in Arabic, the day of standing. And he explained this very simple: we're all going to be brought back, everybody. I said, wait, just Muslims, right? He said, no, everybody, everybody is coming back. I said, what? All the Muslims, all the Christians, all the Yahudi, all of the Buddhists, all of the Hindus, all the Mulhid, all the people will be brought back on the Yom Kiyama. The sixth point in Islam, he told us, is the Qadr of Allah. Now in this case, I could actually see somebody accepting the Qadr of Allah. But how do you explain that to somebody? It means that Allah has already predestined everything. It's already known to Allah what's going to happen, and it's in His control. Now, some people might say, well, how is that fair? I mean, if Allah made me do it, why would I get a reward or a punishment? It's not my fault. But in Islam, He explained it to me clearly. In Islam, we know that everything is a result of our intention, the niyyah. And then He said, Kala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, Innama amalu bin niyat, that everything is by your intention. But then whatever comes from Allah, this is Allah's cutter. And that's when you can live as a Muslim. And I said, how? And look what he said. He said, you have to know what's Islam. And he explained in a way that I understood. Later I took a dictionary and found the words in Arabic. That it's Islam, to surrender, to give up and to submit, and to obey, and to be sincere. Well, wait a minute. If you're going to be sincere, this means what? You cannot force anybody to be sincere. It's impossible. If you force them, they're not sincere. And this is required in Islam. So never did Islam spread by the sword. And Islam doesn't spread with a gun. Islam spreads with the heart. And this man touched our hearts with his behavior, with his kindness, with his generosity, with his good advice that he gave all of us. But especially the way that he was so devoted to his God. When he would stand over in the corner of the house and we would see him praying and he would look up like this. And you would see tears in his eyes. And you would wonder, what is he crying for? I later came to know that he was crying for us. 
He was asking Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Latif, Ya Hadi, Ya Hadi, Ya Hadi. The one who guides, guide these people. Guide these people. They're nice people. Oh Allah, guide them. And tears coming down his face. Allah. Do you know? He said to me the key words. He said to me, I will go to your religion as a Christian if your religion is better than my religion. I said, okay. Hey, we got him now. Because in Christianity, I know you don't have to pray. You don't have to fast. You don't have to make hajj. You don't have to pay zakah. You don't even have to be nice if you don't want to. You just believe Jesus died for your sins. Yay. He said, no. I mean, I will be in your religion if your religion is better, but you need proof. I said, again with the proof. He said, yes. Because there's nothing we do in Islam except we know there's a proof. Whether we know the reason or not, that's another subject. Why we don't eat pork. Why women should cover themselves up. Why men don't go out here touching other women. And why we must never cheat or must never lie. The reasons are with Allah. But we know the proof is from the Quran and the Sunnah. This is what we live by. And again, no matter what happened, he would say the same thing. Qadr Allah, mashallah. I realized he was right. I didn't have any proof. I was just talking. But then, one night when I was really thinking about Islam so much, I found that the Catholic priest accepted Islam. The Catholic priest became Muslim. Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah, ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah. I couldn't believe it. I started to tell my wife. Then I found that she also is interested to be a Muslim. I'm shocked. So I wanted to talk to him again, one more time. So we were walking around in the night outside our house. I asked him about something about my business, my family, the people I know, congregation I used to go with, the Bible, the Quran. Many questions, many questions, many questions, because I didn't know what to do. I wanted him to tell me, why don't you be a Muslim? I wanted him to say that. Why don't you be a Muslim? But look at the hikmah. Look at the wisdom. He said, this is not about you and me. This is not about you and your wife or you and your father or you and the congregation of your people. It, this is about you and him. So you need to talk to him. Now look at this man. He's crying, oh Allah, guide them. But he doesn't say, I want you to be guided by me. No. He let Allah do what Allah does. And he cried for us. He went and prayed. And while he was praying, I went and put my head on the ground. And I said, God, if you're there, guide me. And when I raised up my head, I knew, I knew there really is God. He's one. La sharika la. He has no partners. And I knew Muhammad wasalam, is his last, his final messenger. And I have to follow it. I have to follow it. There's no option. There's no other way. There's deen or not.
And I also knew immediately I had to tell the other people. I have to tell everybody. That's why I'm here with you today to tell you this story. The importance of you. Yes, I'm talking to you. To be the person Allah wanted you to be. To follow that deen and show other people by example. Let them see the beauty of Islam. The truthfulness. Allah says, Ya yuladina amanu attaqallah wa kulu kaulun sadida. The truthfulness. Let them see the integrity. Let them see the honesty. Let the people see that we are normal people. We want good for everybody. We don't hate. We don't hate. We love. We love Allah. We love His Messenger. We love this deen. The thing that we avoid and stay away from is the things that will take us away from that. Let them just see it. Show them Islam with the akhlaq, the character. And then maybe you'll hear somebody say, Ashadu ala ila illallah. Ashadu Muhammad Rasul. May Allah guide all of us. May Allah guide the people. May Allah make it easy for you to share this message. Until next time, this is Yusuf Esri making dua. Ehdina siratum mustaqim. Salam. Saya salah seorang mahasiswi UPP ingin bertanya, bagaimana cara kita sebagai umat Islam menanggapi berbagai isu dari berbagai pihak yang ingin memecah belah umat Islam? Alhamdulillah, dengan munculnya kriminalisasi ulama, dengan munculnya ahok, dengan munculnya macam-macam, kita justru bisa sekarang membedakan mana kawan mana lawan. Yang selama ini kita anggap kawan rupanya lawan, menggunting dalam lipatan, menjegal kawan seiring musuh dalam selimut. Kepinding dia. Nah... Alhamdulillah dengan adanya Isra Mi'raj nampaklah mana kawan mana lawan. Gara-gara Isra Mi'raj lah Abu Bakar dapat gelar As Siddiq. Semua mengkafirkan. Ah Muhammad gila masa dia bisa naik As Siddiq. Dengan isu-isu belakangan ini, disitulah bisa kita nampak rupanya yang selama ini ku anggap kawan rupanya lawan. Ajak dia, dakwahi dia. Kalau kau sanggup, anak-anak muda menjadi cyber army, tentara-tentara cyber yang pandai buat meme, yang pandai buat karikatur, yang pandai buat ajakan, yang pandai buat video pendek berperang kalian di alam maya sana.